wage a war on worry. There is a chapter in your life just waiting to be written in which fret will become a thing of the past, in which peace will be increasing, anxiety daily diminishing. God has a prescription with which we can deal with worry. And that prescription reads like this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. So be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Before I offer a prayer, let me proudly announce that Dean Lynn and I have just entered the world of grandparenthood. But I don't want you to be anxious. I'm not going to be one of those grandparents who shows you picture after picture. I'm not going to endlessly bore you with details and trivia about little Rose Margaret Bishop. I'm not going to belabor you with cute little details like her fingernails that are already long and how she winked when she saw me and how she mouthed the words Papa Max on the very first day. I'm not going to get into all that. Please don't think for a moment that I'll ever use our big screens at church and our microphones to project image after image and tell story. I'd never do anything like that. Don't be anxious. <laughs> We do thank you, Lord, for new life. We do. We're grateful for fresh starts. And those of us who have been around this world now for a few years are aware that it can grow on us and we can grow weary and anxious. Grant us, Father, a childlike faith, a trust in you. Please forgive our speaker. His sins are many. And help us to see Christ, just Jesus. Through Christ we pray. And all who agreed with the prayer said, Amen. Well, I grew up in a camping family. Uh, my dad's idea of a family vacation involved uh, tents and sleeping bags and, and uh, camping gear and, and Coleman stoves and lanterns. I tried to carry that tradition into my family. I didn't succeed. Uh, roughing it for us is a Motel 6. That's about as we do like campfires as somebody else builds them and then somebody serves room service afterwards. Uh, we're not big on camping, but my dad was. And boy, he loved not just camping, he loved the camping gear. His favorite place to hang out was one of those old Army Navy surplus stores. And I remember one summer he came home just a couple of weeks before summer vacation uh, with a new tent. I was about nine years of age, and we were preparing to join my father and, I'm sorry, my father and our family was preparing to join all of his siblings at a family reunion in Estes Park, Colorado. Now, my dad came from a family of nine kids, so I mean, they took over the campground. Well, he was so proud because he had purchased a new tent. And this tent came from the Army-Navy surplus store. It looked like something that come right out of the Korean War. It was huge. It could hold 12 cots. It was huge. It wasn't fancy, but it was big. And to support it, he had two cast iron poles, two of them. 
Now, we think tents. We usually think those aluminum retractable poles. This was solid cast iron pole as thick as my big biceps. I mean, they were, they were big. Why are you laughing? <laughs> He had built these uh, two-by-four braces, uh, foundations upon into which he could place those two poles, and then we would set up that tent. We would often set that tent up around a picnic table. It was that big and still have room uh, to sleep, and it was stable. Nothing was going to blow that tent over. Let the Colorado wind blow. Let the rain fall. Let the hail pummel the ground, but it's not going to knock that tent over. In fact, on one day, one afternoon, Colorado sky got real black, and all my dad's siblings started running to their different tents and cabins and trailers, and I mean, that storm just kept blowing in, just kept wailing like it's been doing here in South Texas over the last few days, and all of a sudden, everybody was out of their tent in our tent, and ours was standing firm. And my dad was so proud, and I can remember him touching those two cast iron poles to make sure that they were steady. I've been thinking that we could all use some cast iron poles like that. Not in our tents, but in our lives. The winds blow still. And if only our winds brought just rain or, or even hail, our winds tend to bring those big Ds, death and divorce or debt and disease. And some of you are passing through hard times, and it's stirring up some winds and emotions of anxiety, and you're very worried. And your question is, is there a place where I can find safe shelter? Well, the Apostle Paul would answer that question with a resounding yes. He believed that there are some truths that can serve like those tent poles serve, that we can establish some convictions in our lives that will do for our souls what those cast iron pipes did for my father's tent. Remember, the Apostle Paul wrote this prescription for peace in a Roman prison. We pointed this out last week. Nero had realized he could curry favor with people by killing Christians. What better known Christian was there than the Apostle Paul? So Paul was under house arrest. He was chained to a Roman guard 24 hours a day. So he had a problem with Rome he also had problems with his churches. The very churches that he began were beginning to call him impo an, an imposter. Uh, there were false preachers who were accusing the Apostle Paul of profiteering or self-promoting. So the Apostle had problems on the out, problems on the in, problems with Rome, problems in the church. On top of that, the guy was 60 years old. He was worn out. His back was covered with scars from the Roman whips and sticks. He had been left for dead twice. He was weary from all that travel. He was a mess. You would think he would write a letter of complaint to God, but he didn't. One of the reasons we cherish this brief four-chapter epistle is because though Paul had every reason to write a letter of complaint, he wrote a letter calling for unbridled joy. And he spoke of a joy that was independent of any circumstance. He promoted a joy that would lead a person to discover an anxiety-free life. In fact, beginning in the fourth chapter, after three chapters of teaching, beginning in the fourth chapter, that's when he said, now be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. And we read that phrase and say, is that possible or is that hyperbole? Is it really possible to get to the point in a person's life where they're not anxious? where they're able to deal with anxieties quickly and put them aside, and they don't live in that perpetual state of anxiety. As we pointed out last week, anxiety serves a helpful purpose. It alerts us to potential dangers. It calls us to react. What the apostles wanting to protect us from is a state of life in which we inhale anxiety, in which we live in a state of worry. And the apostle said we could do this because he had reached two wonderful discoveries. Now, 
Remember, by the time the apostle says in Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing, he has spent three chapters telling us why we can be anxious for nothing. And so we would be wise to reach back and get the context of Philippians and try to understand exactly why we can be anxious for nothing. When you read the first three chapters of the book of Philippians, you find that the Apostle Paul had, like my father, two poles, two convictions, two deep-seated beliefs around which he built his life. We call these a belief system. You have one. You do. If we could somehow flip back the flap of the tent of your soul, we would see some convictions. And these convictions lead to decisions. Belief always creates behavior. So if your belief is right, your behavior is going to be healthy. But if your beliefs are wrong, they are going to manifest themselves in unhealthy behavior. For that reason, any time you read one of the epistles, the Apostle Paul spends the first section of that epistle, whether it be Ephesians or Romans or Philippians, talking about beliefs. He establishes beliefs. The most important thing about you, my friend, is not the car you drive or the amount of hair on your head or your looks or your age. The most important thing about any human being is what we find when we look into their soul, the belief system. When you look into the soul of the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians as well as in any of the epistles, there are two solid beliefs around which he has built his life. This is his belief system. We're going to look at one of those beliefs this week, a second belief next week. But the reason the apostle could say be anxious for nothing is because these two cast iron poles were holding up his tent. You want to know what they are? Belief number one is simply this. God is in control. God is in control. The word for that in the Bible is sovereignty, sovereignty. You'll look in the middle of the word sovereignty, and there's the word reign, R-E-I-G-N, reign. God's reigning. He's over everything. Sovereignty. The apostle Paul firmly believed that God is in control. I mean, he has scarcely placed pen to parchment, and he is talking about the sovereignty of God. In chapter 1, he says, God began doing a good work in you, and I am sure that he will continue it until it is finished when Jesus Christ comes again. We're not victims of fate. God is doing a good work in us. We're children of God, beneficiaries of a perfect plan. And even when things go wrong, they're going to turn out right because of God's sovereignty. The things which have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So it has become evident to the palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Well, sure, Paul didn't want to be in prison. But as Paul considers this through the sovereignty of God, he says, oh, okay. God is using my time in prison to give me an opportunity to talk about Jesus to this soldier from the palace guard who is chained next to me. I have a captive audience. And so it turned out for something good. It wasn't exactly what Paul wanted, but it was good. And those troublemakers in the church, Paul says in Philippians 1.15, that they preached out of envy and strife. Well, that's no problem because Paul envisioned a sovereign God. And whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice and I'll continue to rejoice. He was not worried about false preachers. Because high above it all is a God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So take a good look inside the tent of the soul of the Apostle Paul, and you'll see two poles, one of which says the sovereignty of God. In the treatment of anxiety, sovereignty is essential. Here's why. 
Anxiety is at its core a perceived loss of control. Anxiety is the perceived loss of control. That's what anxiety is. Control creates a sense of calm. A lack of control creates a sense of fear. If we're certain about the outcome, then we feel better. If we're uncertain about the outcome, then we feel restless, we feel troubled. You don't need me to convince you of that, but there are many research studies that unveil this truth. One of the most interesting is an ancient one, comparatively, came out of World War II, in which psychologists looked at the emotional impact or the impact that combat would have upon the emotions of soldiers. It won't surprise you at all to hear that living in a state of attack in combat on the battlefield just does a guy in. 60 days is what the psychologist determined. After 60 days of combat, soldiers tend to be emotionally exhausted. They've lost their capacity to cope, and they need to be restored, find some type of encouragement, find some type of treatment. That's understandable. They were victims of carpet bombs. They were victims of, 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 of tear gas. They were victims of mustard gas, victims of snipers and attacks. They they didn't even know what was coming next. They didn't know whether to run or whether to hide or where to hide. Uh, that, that, that level of anxiety doesn't surprise anybody. What surprised the psychologist, however, was the comparative level of calm found among fighter pilots. Fighter pilots were the most calm soldiers of any of those in the military forces. Unlike the soldiers on the ground, the fighter pilots registered a high level of calm, and 93% of them registered a high level of job satisfaction. Even though one out of every two fighter pilots was killed in combat during World War II, 93% of them said they would re-enlist immediately. What was the difference? Well, the fighter pilots had a sense of control. They could keep their hands on the controls, where the soldiers on the ground felt like they were vulnerable. They were exposed. They didn't know what was going to happen next. The pilots felt like they at least could control. They had a perceived sense of control over their own destiny, and that created a sense of calm. That's interesting, isn't it? Now, you don't have to go to war to discover that. A traffic jam will do just fine. <laughs> German psychologists recently shared with us that one hour spent in intense traffic increases the odds of a heart attack by threefold. One hour spent in intense traffic increases the odds of a heart attack by threefold. This traffic's going to kill us. And we understand why, right? I mean, you can be the best driver since Mario Andretti. You can be alert. You can have your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road, but you can't control that jerk in the lane who keeps checking his text messages while he's driving. You can't control what that lady's doing who's coming in your direction. And there is a sense of loss of control. Anxiety is the perceived loss of control. So, since anxiety is the perceived loss of control, how do we respond to anxious moments or how do we respond to anxiety? Well, one way is to take control to take control, to stockpile cans in case of canned goods, in case of nuclear fallout, uh, to wrap our children in bubble wrap so they won't fall off of a bicycle and, and get hurt, uh, to never give our heart to anyone for fear of having our heart broken, to never step on a crack so we won't break our mother's... You've heard that, I guess. We try our best to take control. Ironically, we discover, he suggests that we do this, that we surrender control 
to God. That we turn everything over to God and trust the sovereignty of God to control everything. We simply trust God to take control. And our focus shifts from managing and hyper-controlling our world to pondering the strength and the majesty of God and what he has done. Peace is within reach, not for absence of problems, but for the presence of a sovereign God. Passages abound in Scripture, reminding us of God's sovereignty. Here's one from the book of Proverbs. There is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. Here's one from the book of Daniel. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Hebrews 1.3 says, he sustains all things, all things. He knows the name of the stars, and he knows the sparrows, great and small. He knows every detail. In the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah asks, can anything happen without the Lord's permission? Is it not the Most High who helps one and harms the other? So the Bible reveals a sovereign God, a God of wonders, a God with a robust plan that will not be de derailed. So God is on the throne. He's in charge of everything. That's what Paul has been saying so far in the book of Philippians. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it. There is no doubt. This imprisonment will turn out for my deliverance. No doubt. To live is Christ. To die is even better. To die is gain. Or God is working in you to help you want to do and be able to do what pleases him. See, to read the words of Paul is to read the words of a man who in the innermost part of his being believed in God's great sovereignty. He was protected by God's strength. He was preserved by God's love. He lived beneath the shadow of God's wing. How about you? How firm are your poles? What's holding up your tent? Do you believe in the sovereignty of God? If your answer is, I'm not sure, or your answer is no, with all due respect, I think we've just stumbled upon the cause of your anxiety. Think of it this way. Imagine three passengers on a commercial flight. They share a row on the airplane. There's passenger A, there's passenger B, and there's passenger C. They have a conversation as the plane is taking off about the pilot of the plane. Passenger A acknowledges something that passenger B and C think is very odd. Passenger A says, you know, I don't think that there's a pilot in the cockpit. I mean, why should I? I got on the plane. The door was closed. I'd never seen him. I don't think there's a pilot in the cockpit. I think we're on a big drone. This thing is being flown by somewhere in some headquarters underground. Well, passenger B says, well, that's kind of wacko. I think there's a pilot, but I just don't think he's awake. I know what these pilots do. Now they get the plane up in the air, and they set it on autopilot, and they sit back with a good book or bring a pillow, and they take a nap. He has no idea. They wake him up right before we land. Well, passenger C cannot believe what she is hearing. She looks at passenger A, and she looks at passenger B, and she says, let me tell you something. We are in a plane that is piloted by a good pilot. He's alert. He's experienced, and he cares. I know because I had breakfast with him this morning. He is my husband. <laughs> and so you have three different views of the airplane's pilot. One person says there is no pilot. The other person says there is a pilot, but he's disengaged. The other said he is a careful, skillful pilot, and I know him well. Fast forward 10 or 15 minutes, turbulence strikes. And the plane starts bouncing around in the air like popcorn inside a paper sack. 
What is going to be the reaction of the three passengers to the sudden arrival of turbulence? What's going to be the reaction? Are they going to react the same way? Passenger A and passenger B are prone to get sucked into the sinkhole of anxiety, right? I mean, they don't have anyone to talk to. They think the thing is out of control. They wonder if anybody's awakened the pilot. Passenger C, she doesn't really enjoy the turbulence. But if anyone's peaceful, she is. Why? Because she has a relationship. She has experience with the pilot. And she trusts him. So who flies your plane? Who flies your plane? I know it sounds like an oversimplification, but there really are three views of God in the world. There is no God. There is a God who started everything and then backed away. And then there is the God discovered by the Apostle Paul and millions upon millions of us. A God who cares, who's in control, who knows his passengers, and who is determined to get them home safely. Who flies your plane? The Bible never promises a lack of turbulence, just the opposite. We will have trouble. But the Bible always promises the presence of a loving and caring God to get us home safely. That's where the cure for anxiety begins. In your understanding, in your belief system, about who God is. The most important thing about you and about me is the way we answer the question, who is God? Who is God? And the way you answer that question would give an onlooker the ability to forecast your level of anxiety. The more you understand the sovereignty of God, the greater the odds that you'll have a peaceful life. The less you understand the sovereignty of God, the more greater the odds you'll be an anxious person. Many years ago, when we as a church were studying the sovereignty of God, I wrote a prayer. And I've used this prayer many times in my own devotions. I never did need to share it with the church, but I dug it out of the files, and I thought I'd share it with us today. It's printed on your Sunday handout. I'm hoping maybe you'll take it home and, and use it as a way to activate in, this, in, in your own devotions a deeper understanding of the sovereignty, the perfect will of God. The prayer goes like this. Dear Lord, you are perfect. You could not be better than you are. You are self-created. You exist because you chose to exist. You are self-sustaining. No one helps you. No one gives you strength. You are self-governing. Who can question your deeds? Who dares advise you? You are correct in every way, in every choice. You regret no decision. You have never failed. Never. You cannot fail. You are God. You will accomplish your plan. You are happy, eternally joyful, endlessly content. You are the king, supreme ruler, absolute monarch, overlord, and raja of all history. An arch of your eyebrow and a million angels will pivot and salute. Every throne is a footstool to yours. Every crown is paper mache to yours. No limitations, hesitations, questions, second thoughts, or backward glances. You consult no clock. You keep no calendar. You report to no one. You are in charge, and I trust you. Anxiety passes as trust increases. So rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord's sovereignty. And see if you soon aren't discovering what the apostle was telling us when he said, be anxious for nothing. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your great and mighty hand. Thank you that you oversee all the affairs of the world. Thank you that there is nothing happening anywhere on the planet right now that has you troubled, surprised, or upset. 
There has never been a moment that someone has asked you a question and you said, I don't know what to do. And there's never been a situation in which you've been presented a problem and you thought, I don't know how to respond. You always know what to do and you always do what is right. Your plan is perfect and you are worthy of praise because you are a perfect God. We're in your hands, Father, and that makes us very happy. That makes us very happy. We'd like to resign from the role of trying to run the world. We voluntarily resign from being king of the universe. We're not going to try to control everything anymore. We're going to leave that job to you. You take the throne. We'll be your follower and your worshiper. May we know your place and may we know ours. This is our prayer through Jesus Christ. And all who agreed with it said, Amen. 